Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tiverton Planning Board regular meeting of May the 7th, 2024. For those of you who are wondering why I don't look like Stu Hardy, our chair is unavailable this evening, so as vice chair, I'm filling in. Um, and we'll start with attendance. Uh, Bill Gerlach? Present. Present. Rosemary. Rosemary Bill. Present. 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 Yay. Present. And Tricia Hilton, I am present, so we have a quorum. Um, to begin with, we have two applications, both of whom uh, the applicant has agreed to continue at our request um, due to the um, volume on our agenda. Um, they were both slated to be public hearings, so what I'm going to do is introduce the items, uh, open the public hearing, and then ask for a motion to continue the public hearing uh, until our next meeting in June. So the first application uh, is a public hearing for a minor land development preliminary plan. The applicant is Irfan Saeed of 3237 Hillside Road in Richmond, Rhode Island. The location is Plat 114, Lotto 104, also known as 331 Main Road, Tiverton. Um, and uh, as I said, this is a public hearing, so I will open the public hearing, and then I'll ask if I could have a motion from the table to continue the public hearing. I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing until our June meeting. June 4th meeting. June 4th meeting. Is there second. A, second. There's a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. And our second application is a public hearing for minor land development preliminary plan. Uh, the applicant is Ashawanx Realty of 395 Park Ave, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. The location is Plat 215, lots 13 and 18, also known as 1588 Bulgarmarsh Road in Tiverton. Um, in the R60 zoning district. Again, I'll open the public hearing and then ask if there's a motion to continue the public hearing until June the 4th. Motion to continue. And a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Um, we have a fairly rigorous agenda tonight, but I believe that we have some folks who are here specifically for um, for one item, I'm guessing, um, which I think is the cannabis item. Gentlemen, is that what you are here to speak about? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do, rather than make everybody sit through, through everything until we get to that, I'd like to have a motion, if I could, uh, to move up uh, planning board item D Amendment to Appendix A, Zoning Ordinance, Article 4, Section 9, Marijuana Store, Recommendation of the Tiverton Town Council, Proposed Ordinance Related to Business Uses in Light of the Voter Approval of a Ballot Measure of November 8, 2022, pursuant to RIGL 2128.11-15. This ordinance defines words and phrases related to cannabis, proposes new uses related to cannabis to Zoning Ordinance Article 4, and proposes specific and objective criteria for cannabis use if it is recommended that a special use permit be required for these cannabis related uses. So this is language that was sent to us for an advisory opinion by the Tiverton Town Council. Um, I did speak with the solicitor early, earlier today to ask him um, to ask him uh, whether or not the council had considered any other locations, was there, you know, this is fairly specific in that I identifies the um, industrial park and specifically the, the PDP zone um, as the location for these. Um, and it was indicated that that's really the location that the council was looking at. So can we just get our motion to move to change the oh, agenda? Yes. yes. I'll make the motion to Thank change, the, to move the item on the order. The second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, so um, what we really can do is, is talk about what has specifically been presented in front of us. I understand that there are folks here who would like to present something to speak. Yes. Um, so why don't you come up and introduce yourselves. Madam Chair, can I, would you like us to 
wherever you're comfortable. Before you get too far, though, I would like to let you know we are in receipt of your written materials, and we have read them and we have reviewed them. I think, as I said, the council has given us a fairly narrow, um, uh, you know, objective here in terms of reviewing what they have sent to us, which is not the same as what is in your the request for your materials. Um, uh, but since you're here, um, we're willing to give you a short period of time, but not more than, you know, three minutes. I would say that in the long run, the case that you should be making is really in front of the town council. They are the ones who will determine ultimately the zoning location for these uses. Um, but if you'd like to present very briefly again, we'll give you three minutes. Um, but if you'd just introduce yourselves first, that would be wonderful. Sure. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate all of that. Um, my name is Jeff Padua. I'm a lawyer here in Rhode Island. I've been practicing here for more than 30 years. I've served as city solicitor um, for the city of Providence. In terms of cannabis experience, uh, I represent 50, 60, 70 um, cannabis businesses in multiple jurisdictions. I'm a lobbyist for cannabis cultivators in the state of Rhode Island. I have business interest in cannabis, and I'm also a regulator myself for an Indian tribe in Michigan. With me is my co-counsel, Nick Gomes, and I also have uh, John Bernier, Bernier and um, uh, Gabriel Roos. Gabriel Roos, thank you, CEO, COO. Mr. Bernier, lifelong resident of Tiverton, lives here with his wife, kids, um, and um, uh, if we ever get to the day where we, my clients have a business here, he will be day to day. He will be the face of it, the operations. He 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 is here. So um, we are aware that the proposal before you is for the PDP zone. We are asking this board and then the council to consider allowing it in the commercial highway zone. Um, it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. Section 5.5, one of the goals is supporting diversification of the town's tax base and increasing that tax revenue through non-residential development while staying compatible with the town's character. Um, the uh, parcels in the HC zone would be appropriate. They have easy highway access. They have great parking, surrounded by other commercial uses, located away from residential, and wouldn't interfere with residences, residences parks, playgrounds, where kids and families uh, gather. Uh, we do agree that there should be some criteria for special use permit. We disagree pretty strongly with um, condition on top of page four, criteria top of page four, uh, which says that no cannabis retailer shall be located within 2,000 feet of any other cannabis retailer, even if in an adjoining community. You would be giving up revenue. You would be keeping any of the challenges or issues. You'd be giving up control. And it, Massachusetts, which has moved much faster than Rhode Island, has located all of their businesses, many, not all, many, on the Rhode Island's borders. All of our residents go there, and we get none of the benefit. And by protecting Massachusetts businesses, you're really not helping yourself. We think that, that we should, we, we agree with 2,000 feet from any other cannabis retailer, but we disagree with even in an adjoining community, because that is to Tiverton's detriment. Um, amending the zoning ordinance does not guarantee that there will be a marijuana retail store here. The state law provides that there are six zones throughout the state. There can be four licenses per zone. Tiverton's in the zone six, which is all of East Bay, from Pawtucket all the way down to Newport. Um, the selection process is, has not been determined. The, um, the Rhode Island Cannabis Commission is meeting to promulgate regulations which will come up with that process. And um, the last go around when we awarded Compassion Center licenses by lottery, which was a result, a, a reaction to what happened to the mayor in Fall River, it resulted in a, a high concentration of these Compassion Centers in 
Pawtucket and Providence and Warwick and left the rest of the state and patients and, and consumers in the rest of the state without ready access. The commission is absolutely going to be much more thoughtful in spreading these licenses around and locating uh, where my clients have a right to a property on uh, William S. Channing Boulevard would be ideal, an ideal location. In the HC zone, um, it, would, uh, it would be perfect. And, and so that's why we're advocating so strenuously for the HC zone, which makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, I appreciate that you were handed a proposal did not include an HC zone. We will definitely advocate to the council. We think it's a big mistake not to include the HC zone. And candidly, I think that by uh, having a proposed ordinance where it's in the planned development park, which is within the industrial zone, basically you're defeating the will of the voters because there's going to be nobody that will be able to qualify to put up a business there. And that's just not right. So again, I understand it's out of your hands. We're strongest, strenuously advocating for adding the commercial highway zone. Thank you. Any questions? Happy to respond or answer. Appreciate your time. I'm clear. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Can I have a minute just to speak? So, I'm born and raised in Tiffany. Grew up working Sorry, on this thing. Oh, Jonathan Bernier. Thank you. Uh, born and raised in Tiffin, been here 40 years. Um, part of their root is dairy farm. Worked on a farm my entire life. My, what my, my position is for the company is I look around, I go around looking for places for us to put dispensaries. Um, as soon as there was an opportunity in Tiverton to put a dispensary, I was always been dreaming about putting one in Tiverton. And this was always a location I would put one in if it was up to my decision. Um, I went to Ranger School, which is now a Dollar General. I bought coffee and donuts at Guimont Farms, which is now Baco's Bank. I shopped at uh, Grand Central Market. I still have dishes from um, the coachman that I use every day. So I've been part of this town my entire life. Uh, we have all the approval from the abutters. I went and seen every single one of them. Number, nobody objects to what we want to do there. My kids go to the long plex for birthday parties, so on and so forth. Their eyes are going to get drawn to that. If there was a liquor store over there, people would have the same objection to it. I think it's a bad location for it. Why wouldn't you want to be where our location is, which is 300 feet away from one that's in Massachusetts, taking all the revenue from our town? Um, I miss the fireworks at Grinnell's Beach. I mean, I know my business partner, we would love to help fund to put that back in action again. Um, so I'm not just from some big corporation trying to come in and put a gas station somewhere or put a big massive shopping plaza or anything of the sorts. Uh, there's a rhyme and a reason to why uh, we want this location, and it works for the town of Tiverton. So, thank you. Thank you. Just notably, the company, Northeast Can, they're currently uh, provisionally licensed in Massachusetts in the town of Swansea, uh, and they're proceeding forward, and they would love to be able to conduct business in your community and really be a community partner, uh, just as they have specific uh, events and providing for benefits to the community, not just tax dollars, but the altruistic um, approach of having the right choice of who your executive offices are, who's going to be doing that, who's going to be making the decisions. Uh, and we believe Northeast Can is a um, great company where we're going to move forward with the town council and hopefully um, we could get a recommendation that they might want to consider other locations other than the industrial district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, uh, discussion? I'll tell you right now, I'm opposed to the going into the PDP zone at all. I too am a town, lifelong resident of the town, and I think it's a very poor location because of the children. It's so close to uh, Ranger School. It's also the long flex isn't there. Children are going to be, and I, since I received the Request. I've been opposed to it. So. Yeah, I, I would encourage the the council to. Um, I don't know the rationale for why um, the industrial zone and the PDP in particular was sort of the singular focus there, but I do think um, sort of given a 
a particular application such as this or other applications that might come before us, having another sort of conversation to consider other zones such as this could be a worthwhile endeavor. I think uh, my understanding uh, is that um, it, the main road commercial district was not perceived to be a, a very good option. Um, and we have so little general commercial left. There's really only uh, a little corner at Sousa in sure. Maine. Uh, there's a piece down, um, you know, there are a couple of pieces down off of Main Road in the Stonebridge area in yeah. south. Uh, so, there were, you know, there, we just don't have that much general commercial. And, uh, you know, the highway commercial is a bit of an issue in part. I, I, I don't. I'm not really sure about the 2,000 feet from any other um, vendor. And uh, as you probably know, there is a dispensary at, in Fall River immediately over yep. the line. So, you know, 2,000 feet from there. And, and I'm not sure what exactly what the rationale was behind that. Um, but there's also that little piece of general commercial that is at the bottom of um, Sousa and Fish. And there was, you know, a concern about... Uh, the, the traffic. So I, I think that the the kind of default location of some place where there could be enough parking that could handle the traffic was in fact the industrial park and the PDP zone. I think the other part of it is is that they are not necessarily separating out a retail cannabis store from uh, the testing center and the other com cultivation. and a cultivation. So Everything's lumped. Perhaps, so everything is lumped. Perhaps that's an angle. And too. that's part. That yeah. is part of it. Everything is. They're putting everything together. And I think. I think that there, the thought might be that, the PDP, um, could be home to any of those things, um, as opposed to trying to split them up. Mm -hmm. As you know, I was involved with the, uh, Tibbetan Power building that plant there, and I think it's a very tight situation uh, in there as far as blasting to put a place like that. But again, it's all safety in my book mm -hmm. um, for children. I mean, I think to your, um, to your point, Trish, and to your point, Bill, there's a couple things that have to be separated here. One is thinking about understanding where we put this store, do we allow a storefront, and do we need to clarify that versus them separating? Because cultivation um, compression uh, and any sort of transference from flour to oil should not be done in a retail setting or in a retail district. So I think we might have to clarify that if they're if they're grouping everything together. And I feel like the original discussion was a, around traffic because in some of the places outside of these areas, to your point, Tricia, was traffic bound. So. I think, I think so. there's a couple of, I think there's two asks here. Well, we have to make a recommendation. We need to make a recommendation. Dick, do you have anything? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, the, to me, that is a horrible place to put it just because that's the largest concentration of children in a whole region most of the time. If you go over there, it's just. Packed with kids. So are you talking about the PDP, the industrial? Yeah. Uh, I spent most of my life trying to keep my kids away from dope dealers, and now we want to build one. I heard the same arguments about the casino. Hey, if we don't build it right there, Massachusetts will build one right on the thing. And we got stiffed on the monies that were supposed to come to Tiverton the first time out. Uh, you know, all of these things that are supposed to broaden the tax base, it seems like, hey, the taxes either get relief for some huge long period of time uh, and don't actually end up doing anything financially for the town. And I, I just think, uh, you know, I mean, it's in the same category as far as I'm concerned as service dogs. Everybody has one, and it can be... Some lady with brought a bull constrictor on a plane that claimed it was a service animal. I mean, mm. The whole thing gets out of hand. So, uh, Trish, I would 
I would recommend that part of our recommendation back to the council be to bifurcate the uses. Can I clarify something actually? Sure. As to location, it does have special use permit criteria, subsection B1 location. A is 500 feet of, of schools, and that's for all. But then subsection B is no cannabis retailer shall be located within 200 feet of any other cannabis retailer, even if in an adjoining community. 2,000. Right. So it's not as to all of the marijuana uses, it's just well, the retailer. It, well, it's interesting that, that that particular subsection isolates retailers, whereas others do not. Well, I, I think part of my, I would have a twofold recommendation, recommendation, bifurcate the uses, give a special consideration to retailers, right, and consider them in other particular zones. And number two, I do, I would like, I don't understand that last part. And even before the testimony of the council here, that was a question that I had because from a sort of a market perspective, and I don't understand that last part of that sentence. I right. Don't either. The, the one thing about the highway commercial zone, though, to keep in mind is that while this particular group is talking about a parcel in the highway commercial zone that is up over the there, 81 at Stafford Road, there are other parts of highway commercial in Tiverton. And once you zone that, yeah. that's the yeah. zone. And, you know, so there's no guarantee that something ends up in the portion of the zone that you, you know, would like to see it in. That is a, you know, that is a bit of an issue. Um, so I go ahead, BA. There's something you want to say I can tell. Well, I, I'm just like processing a little bit. So, thinking about some of those zones um, and understanding sort of the original challenge and also their argument, right? There are plenty of other cannabis distributors, and I'll be honest, I drive past them all the time. I don't see huge lines. Um, so, I think the reality is, is we probably need to expand retail and I'm open to that discussion. Um, I think these discussions around, if it's next to Long Flex or whatever, I mean, I'm at Long Flex twice a week and people are drinking booze while they're watching us play soccer. So I think it's half a dozen one six of the other as far as exposure. So I don't think those are grounds for this, for this discussion. I think expanding where that is and thinking more closely about the areas of the bifurcation and where we will allow retail, I think, is the discussion. Processing is a different story. And I think that should stay in more restricted areas. So do I have a motion on a recommendation? It, it sounds like there's a little bit of a consensus that says retail should be separated out. Um, As a use. Because that may, yep. that, that, that may be able to be located someplace else, mm -hmm. um, but that we are generally okay with the, um, that we're generally okay with the, the other components uh, in the PDP. I just want to make a good sign. Um, oh, it smokes. The, the only other part of the recommendation, I'm trying to get the actual line here is for the council to reconsider that the adjoining communities yes the adjoining community line i can't get there quick enough yeah I, you know i there may be a really good reason i just don't know what it is yeah, yeah so that's somebody may come back and say oh well you know yeah and we're just not thinking of it but once it's okay. in it's in so so first of all Let's try and get through this because we have a lot of things. So, yep. is there is there a motion for the purposes of discussion to eliminate the uh, two thousand foot setback from any other retailer? It's not two thousand feet from any other retailer. It's any other retailer, uh, even if even if even adjoining if, community. Even if it's an adjoining. Yeah. So, would you only want to be removing the restriction to an adjoining, adjoining community? community. Right. Yes. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Okay. So, so would you like to make that motion? I would make a motion to, I don't know the best way, strike? Yeah. To strike the phrase, even 
if in an adjoining community from uh, page four of the draft ordinance, which is section G, section G, subsection one, location yeah. dash B. Okay, there's a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? Okay. Uh, so let's vote on this motion. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Three, two. Three, two. It carries. Okay. So the second uh, component then would be an advisory opinion on the location. And are we making a recommendation that we that we consider other locations for retail? And if we are, we should be s specific. Because the council's not, you know, they're asking us for, for a specific opinion here. So, Tricia, or do I have to make a motion for discussion? Or can I keep talking? Sorry, we're still no, talking. No, you can okay. go ahead. Just, we'll keep uh, talking. But that's okay. I think the one area that I struggle with is I know we're revisiting zoning, right? I don't know if it's going to change highway. Um, Probably. Commercial, it will. I, I would kind of, to have a, I'd rather take a prospective, make a prospective decision based on that first retrospectively on an old map. That's not that it matters, but it kind of gives you a feel of where the community is going. So that's my, my hesitation on voting on or changing the um, where we would consider it for zoning. So I'll only say that if you changed, if you recommended to the council that they include highway commercial and then you change highway commercial and that somehow doesn't feel good anymore, you can also change where it's allowed again. So if it feels right in where Highway Commercial is now and somehow Highway Commercial changes its form or shape in some way that then doesn't make it does it does it somehow doesn't match up in some way you can we can fix that. We okay. can find ways to reconcile those two things again. Okay. Then I I would be okay with Highway Commercial and the current industrial. I wouldn't pull it from industrial um, but I would be okay with retail and highway commercial, but not processing. I would I would like to make a motion that we restrict, uh, hold eliminate. On, hold on, can I have one motion? Is that a motion? I'm sorry. Um, no, I, that is a discussion, sorry, but sorry. I don't know if anybody else wants to discuss. <laughs> so that is. Okay, well, so, so I'm clear about your motion. All uses in the industrial, retail also in the highway commercial? That would be, if I were making a motion, that would be the motion I would okay. make. So let's say that that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. Discussion. Discussion. Anybody? Comments. Rosemary. I, I was going to make a motion just to eliminate it from make sure that we get it out of the PDP. Okay. Everything out of the PDP up front. Okay. Well, we've got a motion and a second. I know. We've got a motion and a second on the floor, so you know we need to. If you. We need to. Okay. We need to. We so. need to take a vote on that. I, the only thing I will say about this, and I'm a li I am just a small amount worried, is that in that we're making sure in everybody's minds that we're thinking about highway commercial and we're thinking about highway commercial at the north end of 81, and we are forgetting that there is high, some highway commercial um, that is you know very close to the industrial park right now. It's you know as a matter of fact it's at the bottom of you know fish industrial and, um, and Sousa Road and you know and once you say that's the zone that's the zone and these might be the applicants today but there might be other applicants tomorrow and you know once you've done it you've done it I I I I, I would be more inclined to for now support the council's current request with the caveat that the zoning update committee and i'll speak for them because we've already been there has discussed um, creating more general commercial 
um, and and keeping highway commercial up at the north end of 81. If that's the case, then the highway commercial zone really does stay up there and it's not any place else. I know it's a little complicated. It would be easy if this was done. This is probably something that will come to the planning board at next month's meeting. Um, but I'm a little worried about the highway commercial portion that exists right now that hasn't been rezoned yet. Rezoned. This is my whole same yeah. commercial. And to Tim Rosemary, your point about the plant development park, I agree. Like so, it's a little muddy because we are in. It is, uh, we, but we but we can as as we take on these other zones, we can send a recommendation to the council that says you know we sent you a prior recommendation, we've rezoned an area, we now think that you know this would fit there or not fit there. So to address that, can we table this or do we rem do I can we rescind our and wait for that our motion? Or do we well, have the, to make a the council yeah. needs something back. They need an advisory from you. I just want to make sure I'm understanding, Trish. You're you're comfortable with the highway commercial that's in the northern portion, but you're concerned with the highway commercial that's down adjacent to the industrial district in terms of location. Yeah. Years ago, the state made us put in a. Uh, Adult entertainment zone, and we. Well, you told me about this. One. Okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah. I just di digress. And fortunately, we put it up in the woods, and it is now. It never got onto a zoning map for some reason, but we did. The council did vote on it. Well, you have and, to. Oh. You have to permit it somewhere. Right. Yeah, it's, it's not its own zone, zone okay. but right. it has to and be permitted somewhere. In the, the day. Right, yeah. but that's not. So, that's not the case. No, here. but I mean, as far as size and everything, I think we have to take that into consideration. I just like to see it die right now. Okay, it, but but, but your, I'd like to see your zones. Be we improved. we need to give we need to give the council yes. a recommendation. Uh, we have, a, we have a motion in a second. Are we staying with that, or is someone wanting to withdraw their motion? Well, that's what I was Should I withdraw this motion to stick with the recommendation to the rezoning? So I, my recommendation would be that we, um, that we let the council know that for now, for now, we have no objections particularly mm -hmm. to the currently proposed plan, but that we do want them to be aware that within probably the next 30 to 60 days, there will be recommendations with new zoning for including the location of the zones for both the highway commercial and the general commercial zone so that they are aware of that and can factor that into their decision process, especially because the state hasn't awarded any of this stuff yet. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's the state of Rhode Island, so who knows when that's going to happen. Um, that, that would be my... That would be my suggestion. I was wrong. Who seconded that? So, I did. Sorry, Bill. I'm so you agree as well? Yes. <laughs> I'm fine with that as long as we can also weave into that narrative the recommendation that perhaps at some future point in time we separate out retail as mm -hmm. as a use to be considered so for a different we, zone. Why don't we? Why don't we include that? That that, well, that motion was already approved. That said, didn't you already? That was the original. That was no. Really, no. No. The only that thing you've approved is to reconsider, or is to strike the two thousand foot language. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to make a motion then that the council reconsider separating the retail use from. Todd, can you read me the list? I, I have them here of the other uses specifically. We have the cannabis cultivator. Cannabis products, cannabis testing laboratory. Yes, that retail be separated from compassion center. Why don't you just say all other uses? Yeah. Pardon? Just say all other uses. From all other uses. So. I'll second that. Retail. Separate from retail. All so there's a motion and a, se and a second to separate retail. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Three to two. All right. So the last thing is, shall we let the council know that we are um, 
We have no objections to their, or current objections, to uh, the existing plan, although we do need to tell them if because they want to know whether or not they we think this should be a special use per, these should be special use permits or permitted by rights. Um, so that's the next question. So I just for whatever it's worth, I've we've I've dealt with with ordinances in other communities. Everything that you would write into criteria for a special use permit is most likely already regulated by the state there is like nothing that they're not already covering that's not already in your zoning ordinance so things like security you know distance from certain things like it's the state regulates the out of these things like a lot of regulation the other component that i'll mention and this may not put rosemary at ease but this you can't just walk into these buildings like a child can go into a liquor store and pick up a bottle and walk to the counter and put it on the counter before they're going to get thrown out and told they can't buy something a kid cannot get in to a cannabis store you show your ID. you have to show your id twice most of the time so the idea that you're with like being in proximity to a school somehow is going to corrupt children is just you can't they can't get in. There are no signs in the windows. There are no pot leaves on the uh, you know like out front like there is in a liquor store that has giant you know flashing signs with liquor bottles and dancing cups and like it's not the same thing. Um, so just for whatever that's worth, having dealt with marijuana ordinances in other communities and having some experience with regulating them and knowing with applicants coming to, to you know, a municipality when we were regulating them under, when they were do when it was under medical marijuana, the state regulations are extensive. So just, again, for whatever that's worth in your discussion. And I believe that if you look at the language that the council has sent us, they have included what their proposed criteria for a special use would be. So they're not asking us for the criteria, they're just, um, they're, they're letting us, asking us whether or not we think these should be special use permits or permitted by right. So, um, is there a thought on that and a motion? Okay. Or a um. I'm just rereading that um, in light of Ashley's comments and just trying to gut check the extent to which um, there is acknowledgement of the state level there. Um, I mean, it does get into safety and security. Uh, odor, odor emissions control plans. I would imagine that is part and parcel of. To my understanding, you have to have all of that to even get a license with the state. You have to have a whole odor control plan. You have yeah. to get like permission from the state police for your security and your on premise. You, ha I mean, they have to have security on site when they're open. Mm -hmm. And would that be condition? We may not know the answer. Is that it would would all of those things need to be um, accounted for in order to receive the license issued by the Cannabis Control Commission? Such as what, Bill? I'm sorry, like a security uh, plan. Th well, yeah, that it's passing muster with whatever the state is laying out. I can't. I mean, I can't say for yeah. sure. I, I, God, what, do you want to answer the question? I, it's my belief that you have to submit it to the local police department. Yeah. Okay. Is yes. that correct? The security plan is vetted. Absolutely. Order mitigation plan. Absolutely. Okay. Vetted yeah. by whom? Uh, it would be vetted by the Cannabis Commission. They have their consultants. Or they make your application eligible for selection. Okay. Okay. So this feels sort of like we're double. I won't say that you're 
your duplicating effort, but basically what they're going to give you is what they gave them. Yeah. Because they're not going to produce anything different. Like, they're not going to give you a security plan that's not going to pass muster with their cannabis control commission. So they're, it's not, a, it's not, you're not asking them to produce something for you that they wouldn't already need to produce and get approved by the state. So, it, you know, it just means you all get to see it. Mm-hmm. Which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. The Uh, problem we run into, or somebody runs into, is if at the local level, you all start making requirements and conditions that would change what they're getting approved by the state. Like, if you make conditions on their security plan that they that isn't approved, like, that would cause them to not be approved by the state, and then you have conflicting yeah. problems. Okay. So you, we, we, that would cause a problem for them, where they would be telling you, like, I'm sorry, but we can't change that. The state, because this, the this state, state has state approved level. this. So in that scenario, we're better served just making it um, sort of a permitted use and not going through the special use permit. You can certainly make it a requirement that they submit those items to you so that you know what they are. Yeah. I, I, well, I that's, then I that's where I would that, be. I personally think that, at least for now, um, it, this would be, uh, this would be a, a good thing to have as a special, special use, use permit. permit. For now. Um, you know, someday when it becomes something that is, we're all a little more used to, maybe then you could have it as a permitted by right. I would suggest that. It's a special use permit. I just want to point out, because I wanted to pull up the map, you know, that piece of highway commercial at the bottom of Sousa Road, you know, it abuts residential property. And, and it's almost right next to Cottrell Farms. So uh, that is my real concern about yeah. saying highway commercial right now, because that's all residential. I mean, not all of it, but a great, the, the, all the stuff on the east side is. Yeah. And I, I which just validates what yeah, we it doesn't feel right there. decided yeah, it, it, before. It doesn't, it doesn't fit there, which is why I think right now I, I, the council settled on the industrial park because it's the one place that they can put it for sure, a zone that they can put it in that doesn't have residential uses abutting. Every place else does. So, so are we going to vote? I think special it? use is important for transparency's sake for the, the neighbors. Mm-hmm. You know, to know, I mean, what's going on, people that, you know, the infrastructure in place and everything. There you go. So, uh, so I'm going to make a motion then that we, um, that we provide a, a positive uh, advisory opinion regarding, for now, the location of these uses in the industrial park as special use permits. Second. Any more Did discussion? You made the motion, uh, I made the motion. Any more discussion? In that case, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. I do think that we should, though, separately have a dis- whether it's a discussion or not, to let the council know that there is a rezoning coming vis-a-vis high this particularly this highway commercial piece here, um, yeah. and that once that's done. Um, highway commercial may be a more attractive location in the future. For retail. For retail. As long as that can be woven into whatever artifact we're given back to the council. Okay. Yeah. Was that last vote unanimous? No, no. Three, two. Three, two. Three, two. Consistent with the comprehensive plan? Um, yes. For the reasons outlined in the Staff memorandum. Yes. 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 Well, Diverse, take- diversification of tax tax base, for example. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. I'm not comfortable with all of those oh, yeah. reasons. Your motion. Motion. Yeah. Motion, yeah. Motion, yeah. motion that is consistent with the comprehensive consistent plan. Consistent with the community comprehensive plan. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor. Motion that it demonstrates recognition of the applicable purposes of the zoning ordinance. Yes. That's Trisha's motion. Second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Todd, can you repeat that, please? Demonstrates 
As proposed, the ordinance demonstrates a recognition of the applicable pur purposes of zoning as presented in the general laws. For the reasons outlined in the staff memorandum. I'll second that. All in favor? Every All opposed? You good, Ed? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. We're good, okay. Sure. All right, I think that we are uh, done. The only question that we ha that I have about this is whether or not we write up something or um, do you think that Ashley and Todd should have a conversation with the town administrator? I will write on the, something. On the, on the potential future, you know, zoning? Uh, so I can write something, and I, in that written recommendation, I can explain that there was discussion about the potential to rezone or change the highway commercial zoning in the future and that you may make recommendations to them at a later date that highway commercial be an acceptable place for retail sales. Perfect. Just to let them know. Yep. Okay. It's in All my right. notes. Moving on. I have to run to all right, Ashley, do you want to go plug in? Yep. What do you want up first, Trish? R120 or R120? Existing. R120 for is first, I think. The R120 amendments. The Thank you. Written. Do you want the map or the ordinance? I think the map first. Do you want the, the current map or the 120 map? Um, why don't you put the. I'll plug it in. Can you put both up real quick? Okay. I can do it. Do you want me to do them like side by side? Yeah, you know, I mean, just go between the two. It was fine. Okay, good. Oops. Just so you know. I can I vote yes on the for this. I, I voted no, but I, you know, no, no. It's, it's, it's what we lost. But just. A reminder um, we have in front of us tonight several zoning ordinances um, some of which are we're taking up right now because they're here to address issues that um, were brought up prior to the institution of the moratorium um, or and or um, the uh, temporary turning to nose of the special use permits um, So we are a bit under a deadline um, to look at this. I think we've talked about some of these briefly at our last meeting, but tonight we need to decide whether or not um, we are sending these with a recommendation to the council for adoption. So we're going to start with the proposed new zoning, the R120 zoning. Um, and I think the existing map is there. I think as soon as Ashley comes back, we'll get another look at the new map, although I think everybody has it in paper copy as well. So we would be moving a, you know, a fairly substantial number of properties into a new R120 zone, which is not quite three acres, it's a little bit under three acres. Um, but these are areas that are not served by public water, they're not served by public sewer, they have a lot of wetlands, hydric soil, um, seasonal high water tables, 
you know, these are not areas that we can overdevelop without significant consequences in terms of both, you know, the quality of the groundwater as well as the quantity of the groundwater. So I'm not going to necessarily ask for a motion up front, but comments, discussion, questions? Just from a from an order of operations perspective to, to know some of the stuff you led with here. So as I went through the, the zoning amendments PDF document, shall I assume that if this were to pass, we would have to then go revisit all of the permitted all of the work that we've been doing in workshops where special use permits, we'd have to go back and sort of like do no. a second take on that to consider the R120 or? No, only because we haven't yet taken up special use permits in any of the residential zones at all. So as of right now, they are all knows. <laughs> And until we take them up as a category, they'll stay that way. Okay. So yes, do we have to do that? But it won't affect. Okay. It won't affect those right now. Okay. Also, Bill, it's just I don't want to trivialize it. No, no, no. You're changing R R80 to, to R120. R120. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I point and I point this out to people. You want to see the change, the, the new map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I point this out to people all the time, keeping in mind that the, the <laughs> primary portion of the, of the watersheds, which is all of the Stafford Pond watershed, so everything right that's cross hatched in that blue there is already three acre zoning in that area, which, which was, is often a surprise to people when they find out that they have no idea. And then the primary portion of the non-foot watershed, which not only includes the 2,000 feet around the pond, but it's 500 feet on either side of all the perennial streams that run up and down through the whole thing, are also in the primary portion. That's already three acre zoning. So, and we've had that in place since 2001. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it has not been a burden for anybody. I, there's really been no complaints. It, it, it's, you know, it's been fine. So, Patricia, I have just, like, I have two questions. Um, one being, when we talk about, I, and I think this is just something we need to be cognizant of, mm -hmm. is you said overdevelopment, but the reality is an appropriate development, right? Like, and I think, is that correct? That we, the appropriate amount of development to maintain the natural resources in the area is why we're recommending this reason. Yes. So just so you know, let me pull up this page. Um, there are about 7,500 single family houses in Tiverton right now. And the last time that we did a um, the last time that we did a um, review of the potential housing units that we could have, um, the build-out analysis, here it is. Let me find this page so that I've got it in front of me. So the, the, the super conservative build-out analysis, just for single-family homes, this doesn't include any multifamily, this does not consider things like the 270-unit Harkins development, single-family, and this is incredibly conservative, is 3,100 additional single-family homes. But that's only based on completely vacant parcels. So that doesn't take into account any parcel in town that is subdividable that has a house on it. So think about how many properties there are in Tiverton, <laughs> farm properties, estate properties, whatever you want, that are eminently subdividable, and some of them subdividable into a lot of lots. That's not included in that. So, you know, when we did a back of the envelope calculation and we looked at some of them, it's double this. So that's another potentially 6,000 single family homes and again that doesn't take into account any multifamily development whatsoever so in so doing this like we're 000. not we're not eliminating development by any 
stretch of the imagination here. I mean, this is not this is not a, a you know we're we're going to make development impossible, but what we are hoping to do is to keep it, you know, to a, a lesser amount than you know another seven thousand, you know, single family homes plus some untold amount of <coughs> multifamily Multi. units. Based on what your environment can handle. Based on what the environment can handle. I mean, we already know that there are neighborhoods in Tiverton now where people don't drink the water. You know, they just, you know, we've already developed beyond the land's capacity to really handle it. Um, and, you know, we know that there are people just in terms of quantity because we don't have an aquifer. We just have fractured bedrock. That's all we've got. And right now we're all swimming in water because it's done nothing but rain for three months. But there are plenty of Augusts and, you know, years where we have a drought where, you know, people are not washing their clothes until they're really dirty, you know, and the kids are all taking a bath in one bathtub because people are nursing their wells through droughts because we just don't have an unlimited supply there. So it's a matter of not, you know, overdeveloping in terms of septic leach it and not overdeveloping in terms of pulling more groundwater out of the ground than, you know, we can replace. And just to further clarify, it feels like we are putting these structures in place to avoid these issues in the future and making sure we have those guardrails to allow um, additional building and development within the framework of, of our environment. Okay. It is. And, you know, I think there may be some developers who own large parcels who are going to at first push back and say, well, you know, before I could have subdivided this into 40 house lots and now I'm only going to get, you know, 27 house lots. On the other hand, you know, there's protection for them because at some point, if there isn't, you might have 40 acres and you can't subdivide it at all because you can't get enough water to subdivide it into anything beyond five house lots. I mean, that's the reality. So I think if people understand that there's a benefit for, for everybody here, um, not just the existing homeowners and the, and the people who already, you know, have houses and are reliant on wells, but, you know, even developers in the future that by not letting it be overdeveloped, you know, it, they will someday be able to subdivide their property. And then the other question I had is I did notice that, and this might be coming in a later iteration, that highway commercial is still down at this one area um, by Sousa Road on this map. Is that correct? Up here? Yes. A little bit down. A little bit. <laughs> right there. There you go. There you yeah. go. Ashley's got it. Yeah. Is that being rezoned as general commercial? Well, only the council gets to rezone okay. things, but I will tell you that the zoning update committee um, has looked at that and has said, we are way short of general commercial land in town. We don't have very much of it. And that um, given where that, that is, it, it might be better to be suited and rezoned as, a gen, as general commercial um, and just leave highway commercial, you know, up at the the northern of end of yeah. 81. And that would give us a little more general commercial land, which we need. Anything else on I do not. this? I don't know. Ashley, Todd, do you want to weigh in on this? You've been spearheading this, Tricia. You've done all the research. I just put words down for you. That's not exactly true. So, it, you know, just so everybody understands, um, Stu Hardy and I, you know, sort of got this started a bit. We worked extensively with Lorraine Jubert at the NEMO program at URI, who we've worked with many times in Tiverton. And, and, you know, that's A, a fabulous resource, and B, she's done so much work over here that she really does understand the conditions that we have on the ground. So that's been really helpful. Um, and then um, Todd and Ashley stepped in and helped us clarify this. Todd, you know, refined a lot of the language um, because we frankly were stealing a lot of it from other communities, which is great because they've already done the work, but it starts to read a little bit like a, 
um, ransom letter because you've got you know you've got sentences from here and sentences from there, and um, so Todd and Ashley really also helped us really kind of refine this and point out the places where we'd gone astray and made some really good suggestions. So it's definitely been a team effort here. I have one more question, Tricia, to be thinking about. And thank you both. Actually, thank you all for that. Um, in some ways, this actually, because like I was thinking, this actually protects the value of the homes that are currently here and the ones to be built. Because, for example, if, you know, somebody does put, you know, 40 houses where maybe 27 should go, and that impacts the water everywhere, people start leaving town, and or it just doesn't become as desirable. Yeah. Right. Okay. It, it, you know, it does. That's one of the things with, that's one of the unknown things about the water, which is that, you know, you can, and I mean, this has happened. I mean, lots of times you can have a neighborhood and two new houses go in and the three houses, not right next door, but three houses, four houses away. Now I don't have enough water. I mean, that's, this is, you know, this is what happens when you have fractured bedrock and you're just in veins. And if everybody ends up in the same vein and it's not a great producing vein, okay, now we don't have enough water. That's, you know, that's what we have here. Um, you know, and the, the other thing, and I've said this before, and this is completely kooky, but this is what Rhode Island does. We're one of three states left in the entire country that still subscribe to this um, colonial error um, law of absolute dominion over the water, meaning if you can take it out of the ground on your property, it's yours and you can do with it as you please and you can waste all of it. And it doesn't matter if you dewater your neighbors. It doesn't matter if, you know, if, if, if you want to turn your mega sprinkler on for 14 days straight and the entire rest of the neighborhood has no water in their wells, there is no recourse whatsoever. It's yours to do with as you please. So, you know, that's a that's an issue. Other states are a little more sophisticated, move beyond that. So there's the map. There is also a set of um, ordinances that go with this because obviously we had to change the references to um, R80 in the uh, in the zoning ordinance to R120. Todd, do you want to? I know that you did a lot of those changes for us. Actually, do you want to point it out? I can. So we've fixed the definition of residential R60 to identify in concurrence with the map. We've identified the residential 120, what that means. Then you have pages of the district use table showing, as Trisha said, all the conversions from R80 to R120. And then the final couple pages of, of this document just are again changing R80 to R120 where appropriate. And then on the very last page is the table for rural residential <coughs> development, which I think we should talk about um, in, in just a little bit. So we'll leave that for now. But. Um, do we have any other questions or comments or thoughts? I don't know if there's anybody in the audience that wants to say anything about the R120 before we... You also have to understand this is part of a larger package with the conservation development system. Right. All this is phase one. Nope. Are we voting on these individually or yes. as a package? Individually. I would prefer for you to do map. Or I'll call it the R120 changes yep. and then the conservation development. Okay. So, um, is there anybody who'd like to make a motion on the R120 on the map? Um, this is a motion to recommend. To recommend. Yes. I'll make a motion to recommend uh, the adoption of the new R120 um, zoning map as presented and discussed this evening. Second. Um, there's a second from Dick. Any further discussion? Chris has got oh, some. Chris, did you want to say something? So I just want to make it clear that to the extent that somebody has a platted property that is less than R120, it's pre-existing, not conforming, they don't have to go to zoning to, to, to build. I mean, they're still under the 
would fall into the, what it was pre-existing. They're pre pre-existing non-conforming lot or would become such, and and with the new statute from the general in the general laws, the setbacks are going to be proportionally reduced. Yeah, that, and if it was R80, those setbacks are going to fit within a <coughs> more likely R120. Probably. Okay. Yeah, this really isn't going to affect in any sort of meaningful way existing homeowners. This really is about you know land that would be subdivided in the future. In full disclosure, there are some R40s lots being converted to R120, right? Yes, there are. There are. And there are some R60 lots. This paper was in our packet somewhere. Yes. Okay, where are these? Oh, these are the, and, and it's, they're listed separately. Ashley, can you go back to the new map? There, these lots right here. So this, the R60 zone was a block. So you know, it's easy, it's a whole, it was a whole block. R80 is a block. But these are lots that were in the middle of this R40 zone that are being converted. Okay, what I'm referring to is a, a it doesn't have a, it just says proposed inclusions for 120 zone. And it lists. Uh, Those are some notes that Tricia made to try to help you understand what was being converted. Yeah, the, that's a list of the R40. Ashley, can you put the old map up for a second? This entire yellow block, this whole, this, not the one up there, but this whole yellow block right here is R60, and that's being converted to R, R120, right? This whole yellow Everything down here, which is R80, is being converted to R120. In the R40 zone, and which is what it looks like now, and Ashley, can you sh could you show the new map? Unlike the other two, the whole block isn't being converted, but there are some lots here that are going to be moved from R40 into R120. And these are primarily lots that are on the east side of Highland Road. So they're on the east side of Highland Road and they go all the way over to Fish. In truth, the um, Rod and Gun Club owns a lot of them. Okay. And not that they have any intention that we've ever known of to do anything with them, but they're not permanently protected. So, you know, at some point in the future, you know, for, for whatever reason, if the Rod and Glen Club decided to divest those large parcels, which are currently zoned R40, um, instead those parcels would be rezoned as R120. Okay. Because the only one that is protected in all of that is the one that's, that's open space. So because it wasn't a block, we, as a courtesy, oh, no. made that There's list so numbers. that you would have the lot and plat numbers for, for just that section, because it wasn't a whole block that was being converted. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. I just didn't know where they were. I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, on, on your map here, they're yeah. right here. They Understood. used to be yellow, but oh. there you go. Anyway, so we have a motion in a second. Anything else? All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Then do I have a motion and on the actual uh, language on the zoning? <coughs> zoning ordinance amendments. On, on the zoning ordinance amendment regarding uh, R120. I'll make a motion that we. That's only. It's only this, this one. document, yeah. so which has got Article 3 at the top. Yeah, Appendix A, Zoning Article Ordinance, three. Article 3, Zoning Districts. Yep. This one, um, although I would ask that we exclude from the vote for now Article 9, Rural Residential Development. So it would be Article, those changes contained from Article in. Three and seven, but not nine. But they'll make his motion to adopt all of it, and then you can amend it. To amend it? Okay. 
why don't you explain why you want that done? Okay. That's the one that with the zoning districts? Yes. Okay. So, Bill, your motion is to adopt the R120 amendments shorthand? I'll make a motion to adopt the R120 amendments as second. discussed. Dick is second. Any, <laughs> any other Dick is. <laughs> any chop, other questions? Chop, chop, my man. <laughs> In that case, all in favor? Well, you, well, you gotta, you you gotta pull exclude? out. <coughs> you gotta pull out Article Why? Nine. Okay. So, when we get to the conservation development piece of this, and I'm going to ask Ashley to talk a little bit about this. The question is: Is it worth keeping any of the rural residential since we have something else that potentially <coughs> replaces it? Um, Todd was good enough to include this, so it was here in case we won't well, know. I guess, but. We may or may not end up keeping that. I'm going to ask. But you don't ask have. Talk about that. You don't have a proposal to strike the rural residential right now. No. We so do. I would suggest you keep this until that yeah. changes. So I think we definitely have to have the conversation about whether or not you keep rural residential developments and what form you keep them in, because the way conservation development is written there is some you know we talked about this when when we were going through it that there's there is some pieces in here that disincentivize the use of parts of the rural residential development ordinance but i think for now it's probably best to just leave it and then we can reconcile those two parts later on if we end up striking it or maybe we end up modifying it so that there is more of an incentive, whether that's through, you know, making changes to the conservation development side of it or somehow incentivizing the res the rural compound part of it. But I think for now you should Keep probably it, although, leave it in there. Although if the conservation development ordinance passes, how can you do a rural residential because it says all subdivisions are going to be conservation. But it says four or more. Four or more. Oh, okay. Four, yes, I suppose that's true. All right. In that case, I'm going to um, I'm gonna ask Bill to rephrase this motion, and we'll just adopt the entire thing. We'll, that's we'll, that's we'll, what I did. Yes. That's what I did. I did it okay. as a whole. So we um, don't in have that to. case, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? You're good. Okay. Unanimous. Okay. Moving on. What is the next thing on our list is the... Um, Conservation development. Okay. So we talked a bit about conservation development um, the last time. Uh, this is the ordinance. And um, it's pretty comprehensive, although, as Ashley will tell you, this is in many ways step one. At some point, um, you know. In the future, we're going to have to refine this a little bit further, but we have some other things in coming. Um, Just say it. What? That you have subdivision regulations coming yeah, oh, as well. It, there are subdivision regulations. But there are also some other technical pieces coming. So I think that you've heard Stu mention that um, we have someone who is doing a review of our low impact development regulations, um, and that's pretty thorough. And when that comes back, when that's done, there's probably going to be a significant number of recommendations <clears throat> of things that we put into our subdivision regulations that will affect this. Um, we also probably need to engage someone, and we think we have the name of someone, um, to help us do some hydrology work. Um, you probably know that the town administrator is doing, has engaged Ashley's firm to do um, a hydrologic modeling study for the public, you know, water suppliers. But for the well water and our soil conditions that we have here, we probably need to actually hire somebody to do a little bit of evaluation based on the soil types that we have um, to help us think about things like, you know, a uh, high water table ordinance, um, requirements for wells, things like um, uh, wellhead setback areas, but we need to get that science done. The other piece that Tav is talking about is that once we, if we adopt this conservation development, there's a companion piece to this that you will get, 
very soon, not at the last minute, I promise, um, which are the subdivision regulations which will have to be updated to go along with this. So um, this is a pretty comprehensive thing. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read through it. If we want to sort of go through it on a section by section basis, if you guys feel comfortable, what is the board's pleasure here? I mean, there's a lot of information here. I mean, I did go through it. I think it would be helpful to talk it through at some level. Like, are, are there any, you know, there's 19 pages here. Are there any subsections that are more noteworthy than others that we should zero in on? We could do that. We could do a high level of the, you know, sort of fifty thousand foot view components to this. That would be helpful. And then, if anybody's got a question about any of them, we can dig in. Sure. So it starts with the definition. We have to have one of those, and then, um, and then there is a dimensional table. Um, you'll notice that we are covering both single family and um, multi-family Multi. development. So Shoot. any. You okay, Tom? We didn't discuss something in the zoning, the R120 amendments, and that's the inclusion of a new use, Can the three-family dwelling, and we split out the multifamily to with and without public water. You're, you're, you're confusing me. District use table. We created a new use of three family dwelling. Yeah. Special use permits required in the, the R30 and R60. But right now there are no's, right? Three family does not exist. Doesn't exist. You it got the no. your categories go from two family to multi family. So anything mm -hmm. over two family would be a multi family currently. And we did that in conjunction with the conservation development ordinance. Can we amend it now? Amend what? You'd have you have to amend this. You just yeah. said it's, it's already you approved there. it. Yeah, you already approved it. Oh, you did. I need to make sure you're aware of what you approved, though, when you adopt the R120 ordinances. That you created a new category of residential use called three-family dwelling. Yes. And we also split out the multifamily, one without public water and sewer, one with public water and sewer. And just, just for the record, could someone elaborate as to the rationale for that, for the new three-family dwelling? Right, the new family that's being proposed because, as Ashley said, you only had a two-family dwelling, and then it went straight to multifamily dwelling. And the conservation development ordinance is all geared towards mandating for four, four units or more. Mm -hmm. So to help with the definition of what multifamily was in that. Sure. Okay. It bridges the gap between those two things. And you'll notice that the three-family dwelling requires a special use permit in the R30 30. in the R60 zone. Um, which is more than what is required for a two-family, but less than what is required for multifamily. A multifamily with public water and sewer, I should say. Because, so, because the multifamily with public sewer and water is permitted by right, is what's being proposed. If there's no public water or sewer, it's not permitted at all. I do you have a question Go ahead. about the three-family dwelling and it's not being broken out with public water or because that's a lot for for a while. But I guess it depends on the size, right? Well, or is it R30 and R60 expected that those areas just happen to be where there is public sewer? Yes. Yes. Okay. R R30 and R60 have have public water okay. and and some of it has public sewer. Eventually, all of it will, but they all have public water. Okay. So then, uh, my problem is solved. I'm good. Okay. Okay. So does anyone want to reconsider your prior vote with that new knowledge, Rosemary? You're good. I am good. Okay. There we go. I apologize. 
It's all right. There, there, there are a lot of moving parts here. <laughs> Um, so, I feel like we need a whiteboard with some <laughs> stickies and yeah, be able to connect all of the dots there. <laughs> if you saw what my desk looks like, yeah, how many versions of things I have. Um, so back to the conservation development. So, so, so back to that. Um, uh, I think that... Um, You have a dimensional table already in your regulations. Yep. We included lines for the conservation development um, housing, right? That will point to the new. That's it exactly sends you to does. that article. Yeah. Right. The, the rationale behind doing that is that the, the fundamental difference between conservation development and conventional development is the dimensions, basically, because at the end of the day, you get the same number of units. It's that those units get pulled together on smaller lots with smaller dimensions. So it felt like the right thing to do to make sure that in the dimensional table that it was clearly represented what the conservation development dimensional standards were. So we wanted to make that clear in there. but in order to not make it confusing, we, we wanted to at least put in the reference to send you to the correct article of zoning for the dimensional standard. So this mm -hmm. was the, the best way we came up with to do that. So yeah. if you, you go, claim ignorance. right, right. We didn't want to leave it out, Yeah. yeah. Um, but we also didn't want to clutter it with more numbers that would confuse people. So this was the halfway way to do it solution and those those new dimensional standards for conservation development begin on page 12 here yeah. before we get there though we need to talk about the change in the density for multifamily well conventional multifamily I have a dumb oh question. yeah no to, such thing just to, to to like take us up like a couple of feet in does this replace what is currently in these articles, or is this a designation where someone is saying, I want to take a conservation approach to development? Is this now our new standard, or is yes. this additional? Okay. It's your new standard. Okay. It's required for any development over four units or four lots. Okay, great. And then, Trisha, you did explain this before. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Is this is a new, in essence, for lack of a better word, um, way to develop areas in a conservation grid, and we're just trying to employ those best practices. Here. Yes. Right. Yes. Before we leave the dimensional yes. table, do you want to talk about the density actually? Sure. Multifamily. So, currently in your dimensional standards, the calculation for multifamily development is that you you have to take um there are multiple ways of calculating density we're just trying to fix what's presently there to make it more environmentally friendly to preserve what you right. have right there may be a second look at this later on to do it a different way but this is a an easier fix right now I think the thought was that we are a little bit or have been a little bit generous in terms of how many units you could get on a piece of property in a multifamily development. So there's this, we're, we're using the same model that we used to calculate, which is kind of like if a train leaves Chicago model, but that's the model that we have. <laughs> um, but um, we have increased, um, you know, slightly which would you know the amount of it looks land. like 50 percent like we're 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 tacking another padding another 50 percent so if the original is 10 and we're yeah yeah that's consistent though. yeah yeah what i'm just i'm trying to find a yeah, we'll get, a, yes, it is. We didn't a mathematical the sort of constant yeah. here, we just and it's not the just the calculation no, from well, multifamily yeah. for how many units, yeah. the yeah. density calculation, and, and, and it and the increase we tried to make sort of consistent depending on you know what zone and what size of lot you have. Okay. So um, the the general the general requirements here, um, a couple of interesting things. It, 
In our zoning code right now, if you're doing a multifamily development, unless you get a variance, the only thing that you can build is an apartment complex, like one building. You're only allowed to have one primary structure. So that means that you couldn't create a townhouse development where you have, you know, three townhouses connected and then another three. You couldn't do a cottage colony kind of thing. It's all going to be in one giant building, which I don't think is necessarily aesthetically um, what we want. And I, I think, you know, if, if you could develop, you know, if by right the parcel was big enough and you could have 50 units, do we really want a 50 unit apartment building? So um, this now allows um, on a multifamily development that you can have multiple structures. So you could have different kinds of multifamily besides just one big building. There's a whole section devoted to that yeah. in the standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Let's see. But in the dimensional table, we have to make a few corrections, updates, I'll call it, after the dimensional table in that same section, Article 5, though, to include, oh, go back up, Ash. Right, a line for conservation developments to refer to refer to the new section. Yeah. And, then, and then the density is next, I think, Ashley. We had a, a line in the density section. Again, all pointing to new exactly. 26. Right. right. Yeah. So, again, people can't. Claims ignorance. And then if you go to Article 26 is really where this starts, and there are purposes, um, and there are 10 of them, which I think are pretty good. Um, this is big. We are requiring these for all subdivisions. It's, this, is, this is a requirement. Right now we require the kind of version that we have of conservation development, which is rural residential developments, we require those in the watershed. Um, but now we're going to require this everywhere, including in North Tivern. And it doesn't matter where the development is, if it's more than four units. Although there is language here that says if the applicant can make the case and the, and the planning board feels that a traditional conventional development um, would better suit the goals and objectives than the planning board does have the ability to grant a conventional, a more conventional subdivision. Um, uh, one of the things that we have included in here um, is uh, DEM is under a lot of pressure when it comes to OWTSs and lots of records. So if the town says something's a lot of record, DEM will find a way to give them an OWTS permit, which often includes variances. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, Jamestown, which had a significant problem with septic leachate, developed this state-of-the-art high water ordinance with the water quality people at DEM. And 10 years into it, not only did it not work, it's worse. The water quality is worse. And the reason that they figured out is that they hadn't counted on DEM giving out all the OWTS variances that they, that they ever <laughs> expected. So we don't, and, and often now people develop lots or do a yield plan or figure out how much that they can have. And the engineers, you know, know that they can get variances. So we're saying we can't tell DEM not to give people variances, but what we can say is when you're creating your yield plan or figuring out how many lots that you have here, a legitimate lot can't be based on the fact that you're going to get a variance from DEM. So that'll go a long way, I think, to helping, uh, you know, prevent more septic systems in a place that we want. Um, can I just? Go ahead. You like the 10,000 foot view, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and actually correct me when I'm wrong, but we're taking, for example, 20 acres, and if the yield plan says you can have 10 houses on that, we're not changing that. What we're saying is you have to devote 50% of that 20 acres to open space, and you still get your 10 lots. Yeah. They're going to be smaller, but you still get those. And we're also allowing you to do, you can have a four, 
four unit structure with a couple of uh, single family homes and a duplex. And we wanted them to be set back, right, at different levels to give it some dimension. Is that fair? Yeah. And yeah. Trisha, you kind of explained this kind of urban or lack of like town planning in one of our. Yeah, you had a great visual yeah. last time that, yeah. that yeah. illustrated so sort of conventional versus putting, the clustered. Yeah. Right, exactly. So this is putting that to paper. It's not a cluster, though. What? <laughs> Wrong choice of words. It's a subset of cluster. It is what <laughs> I've been calling it to make some peace between my friends. Well, the, uh, the, the, the basic difference between a conservation development and a cluster subdivision is that cluster subdivision takes you as far as shrinking down the lot sizes and clustering the development into a section of the property. Conservation development goes... A, couple of steps further in really taking the design of the subdivision and doing it backwards to the way it's traditionally done, which is looking first at doing a site analysis of what is the highest and best conservation property on the land? What is Where is the most valuable property for conservation purposes? Take that, take that out of the equation. What's left? Develop that conserve what's most beneficial in terms of conservation and then develop the marginal property that's left over. Yep. When you do a cluster development, you don't do that site analysis first. You just, it, not to say that cluster is not valuable because it is, I mean, you still get a better development out of it because you're not sprawling out across the entire property. But what you get out of conservation design that you don't get out of cluster is you get the highest valued land for conservation purposes set aside. Mm -hmm. And that's not part of the lots, which makes sense, right? It's because not part of the lots. Can, right. They get the whole lot and they can do whatever they want with it. But in reality here, it's getting chunked. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The tools to do that will be in the subdivision regulations. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going. I'm just looking at other things that are sort of you know high points in here. Um, so I'm on page ten. This is where you do your. This is what explains your density calculation, and that is based on a yield plan. And that is where the applicant has to give the planning board essentially. Um, a subdivision that is designed under the conventional standards that set that shows this is the number of lots I can get and this is where there is language that says you can't assume you know you're getting a DEM variance for your septic you have to you know they have to be fully you know so it's like the conventional versus the um, conservation Right. I mean, the like conventional the conventional subdivision design is the basis for your density. You have to essentially okay. prove to the board, like and more. and the board has to accept that yield plan, and that's all laid out in the subdivision regulations. It's a stepped process. The board has to accept that yield plan and say, you know, yes, this meets our standards. Yes, we would accept this yield plan. Um, that is your density. And then they take that density and they design that number of lots into that other 50% of the property. And they can, you know, to Todd's point, they can take that minimum lot size. So if it's 30,000 square feet, they can go down to 30, they don't have to go down to 30. So they can have 30, they can have 40, they can have a 60, they can have, you know, they can vary the lot sizes, they can do a duplex, they can do a single family, they could do a multifamily. Um, so you really get, you can get good variety and good, you know, design out of a conservation development. And ideally, they work with the topography. So because they have varying lot sizes and because there's a lot of leeway on things like frontage and 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 slope and all that sort of stuff there isn't this mandatory you've got to have you know this much frontage on the on the roadway within there so it it gives them a lot of flexibility in terms of how they place the houses and where they place the houses and they may not all be like sort of sitting facing the street and some may be a little closer to the in to the you know street within the development 
and then others may be set further back down a little bit of a driveway. So there's a lot of flexibility there in terms of you know how you cite all of these things variety. and variety too. And um, we were talking last night at the zoning update committee. There are two; they were done as rural residential developments, but done very much with sort of the conservation design. If you've um, ever driven through either Abel Hart um, in South Tiverton, or if you've driven through the Bliss Homestead, which is um, Old Farm Road off of... Same developer. Same developer. They, they're both Dennis Talbot developments, and they're beautiful, and they're, you know, really, really well done, and they both have big set-asides of open space. So, uh, you know... The, it, I think the landscaping... Um, adds an awful lot to the developments, which some people don't, you know, enforce. But, uh, and so do homeowners associations. The other thing we talked about last night is that, you know, this is gonna go to the town council for public hearing. There will be people that don't understand this. There, you know, obviously there's there will be people that may not like the concept of this. And I've been through public hearings for conservation development. Um, I've kind of heard the, you know, gamut of arguments about why not to do this. Um, it, you know, people will try to make an argument that like it devalues my property. I don't, you know, I, I can't get as much for a 30,000 square foot lot as I can for, you know, this 60,000 square foot lot or whatever, you know, there, there, is, there are studies that show that conservation development lots hold their value equal to, you know, a standard lot. There is, there is a inherent value in a conservation development lot that abuts permanently protected open space opposed to a lot that abuts an adjacent property that is owned by someone else that will eventually get developed into an, another subdivision. So if they're designed properly, all of these homes can be situated, should be situated around the open space so that all of these either look onto open space or back up to the open space so that there is that value that gets retained in these properties and it stays there because they it won't it will not get developed. It's not owned by somebody else. It's not going to get you know, turned into a subdivision later on down the road. Um, you know, I heard at a public hearing, you're going to force me to watch my neighbor cook his breakfast in his underwear, um, and I don't want to do that. That's not why I moved to this town kind of argument. And, I mean, that is an argument that you're just, it's, it's an uneducated argument. You don't understand what a conservation development is or what it looks like because clearly when you look at the visual pictures that, that were shared with you the last time you talked about this, that's not what they look like. Um, that's not what a conservation development yields. And, and, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is this is only for subdivisions of four lots or more. That it does not mean that somebody cannot buy 10 acres and build their dream house on it. Right. I, I mean, this is not, this is for subdivisions that are being done of four lots or more. Or that has had 20 acres for the last 15 years and is gonna cut off a lot, two lots, one for each kid. kid I mean, yeah. they can still do that. They, they, they can still do that. So this is really not, uh, you know, somebody who wants to live on, you know, three acres or five acres or whatever it is they want, that's still completely allowable. It doesn't affect any existing properties whatsoever. Um, so it's not forcing anybody to watch their neighbor cook breakfast. I mean, it's your, you know, once these developments are done and they're for sale, it's your choice to move into one or not. It's not, you know, nobody's going to force you to, to live there. There are 7,000 other opportunities of existing houses <laughs> right. that were not developed right. under conservation and design. Never, and, you know, never mind, as Ashley said, somebody who wants to just, you know, they've got a farm and they want to subdivide two pieces, one for each of their kids or two lots, I'm going to sell this lot and I'm going to sell that lot. I mean, that, like, you know, that's... Yeah, for, for me, this is, I would consider all of this really good involved thinking and probably something that should have been. 40 years ago, but 
well, it, and, there. It well, it is in our comp plan that we were supposed to adopt this, but we're only now getting to it. So. And there is a provision in the in the in here that does give the applicant an opportunity to petition the planning board that you know if they believe that they can meet the you know the letter of zoning and the comprehensive plan under a conventional subdivision, and they can convince you of that that you you can permit them to do that. Actually, there are other communities that have adopted this mm -hmm. that are local for you, you uh, Yeah, I mean, most, I will say most of the Rhode Island communities that have this uh, implemented it as optional. Um, but uh, Exeter has it, North Kingstown has it, uh, Charlestown has it. Uh, just jump in. You West looked at Greenwich a bunch of them. It, uh, Lincoln has it. Smithfield has it. Yeah. Um, no. I don't, I don't think Westerly has it. I don't think it. Westerly does. Hopkinton has it. Um, Exeter has it. Yeah. Charlestown being the most recent. Yeah. Charlestown, Charlestown just adopted it in just December of 2023. Yeah. 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 There was yeah. there was a, a movement, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago, where they were, DEM was promoting this. They actually wrote a conservation design manual, um, which is not even in print anymore. Um, Although it's still online. I don't think anything's really in print anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, where they were, they were going around and they were helping communities implement conservation design. I actually spoke with Scott Millar, who is the person that worked at DEM, um, that was the, you know, was the guy who went around and did this. He's an Exeter resident and he's on the Exeter planning board. Um, he offered to, for a very nominal fee, come to if you adopt this to come to Tiverton and do a training with the planning board and basically teach you how to go through the conservation design process so if that if you adopt this and that there's an interest there I would highly recommend having him come and walk you through um, that process and do that training with you because when you when you see the subdivision component of it there is a 10 step subdivision design process that you basically go through and he's willing to come like I said for a very small fee um, and and give you a, a training on how to do that work uh, one other thing that's really notable in here I think is that um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, lot coverage. Um, we have. We're doing pervious. We are really going to, and, and we've talked actually a lot about this with John Hoyle in the zoning update committee, right? So we have this thing in our zoning code called building coverage. We used to have both building coverage and lot coverage, which is why there we have two de two definitions that are in our zoning code. And at some point along the way, somebody talked us into getting rid of lot coverage and making it the same as building coverage. But for our purposes, and, and we're going to start with conservation development, but this is probably something that is going beyond conservation development, which is to get away from building coverage and really start focusing on impervious cover. You know, how much of the lot is impervious? And it doesn't really matter about whether, you know, buildings or, or not. It really matters about how much of the whole thing you've paved or covered up. So this is really kind of the first place where we're going away from, you know, building coverage and we're really going towards, um, you know, lot coverage and impervious surface. Where am I? Right there. Oh. Turn. Turn. Page 14. 13. Oh, Spot here we go. In total impervious, 20% maximum. So just so you know, the, the accepted conventional guideline nationally on the health of a watershed is that if you can keep a watershed at 10% or less <clears throat> of impervious coverage, you've probably got a pretty healthy watershed. That's like, that's the, that's the goal. Um, we are allowing people to have 20% impervious coverage here because keep in mind, the other 50% is going to have zero. So, you know, it, it equals out to 
ten percent overall for the lot. You've got a condensed lot now. Yeah, and yeah. and you can and you and you may well have a dense lot. I mean, so um, there'll be you know twenty percent impervious lot coverage. It's a little bit higher for multifamily, just because um, in an effort to encourage, if we're going to have a multifamily development, something like a community room or maybe a community some other community space or. Um, the swimming pools, the a swimming pool, or something course. like that, or a sports court. We've given them a little bit higher, um, but that makes for maybe a nicer multifamily development. Um, I think I already mentioned that the multifamily is now going to allow um, different types of structures, so it's not just apartment buildings. But there are limits. So if it's a duplex, there's a limit of two. If you're going to do a townhouse structure, it's no more than four townhouses in each building. Um, and if you're gonna do a traditional apartment, it's a limit of eight in each building. Um, multifamily developments. And I think for those people who are horrified at looking at um, Pocasset Reserve, there's a mandatory 75 foot no cut buffer around any multifamily development. So um, you won't have the, I cleared the lot, I took down every single tree, and you know it, it's now sitting there vacant. I also think it makes a nicer development, actually. People like trees. They like coming out of their building and seeing some trees and some wildlife. And, and so, you know, except for the entrances, you know, in and out of a multifamily development, it'll be treed around the perimeter, which, you know, is I think better for the people driving by, but I think it's really nicer for the people who live there to you know go out and see some um, some trees. Um, the setbacks in uh, a multifamily development have been cut way way down, um, with the idea that you know if they have internal sidewalks, there's no reason that the building has to be 40 feet from the sidewalk. Um, it can be a you know more walkable place. There are a number of these things that are not reducible by dimensional variance. So those are uh, firm requirements. Um, we said that all multifamily um, form units or more have to have public water and uh, public sewer. Um, and I think those are a lot of them. I only had one question in all of this um, which is about the open space so the 50% open space in a single family development the open space um, as, as a lot or whatever the op or lots because it may be multiple lots um, have to be uh, essentially signed over if the town is willing to accept them as open space to the town of Tiverton or to some other third party conservation entity that the planning board accepts, like the Tiverton Land Trust or the Nature Conservancy or something of that nature. That's so that those areas will never be, they'll never be touched. They can't be used for passive recreation. They can't be used for anything else. If our goal is to protect Groundwater. There's nothing better to protect groundwater than you know forested upland that's untouched. It's the best filtration system there is, um, and we don't want them to eventually, you know, end up with a motocross you know track in there that the kids built or, or whatever it is. Um, if it's a multifamily, then then that's a little bit different because it's all on one lot. So then the ownership stays with either a homeowners association. Um, or if it's a rental property where there's you know one owner of everything, it, it stays with them, but it does have to have a conservation easement in it. Um, we are allowing on a multifamily development the 75 foot no cut buffer, and if they've set aside any community space that's pervious, up to 25% of that pervious space, so if they have a community garden or they have a community park area, um, that can be applied towards the 50% of open space. Um, which brings me to my only point. I'm just wondering in uh, Article 9, 
number three on open space because we're not requiring no cut buffers and multifamily. Does that need to say in a multifamily development or is it just inherent? Is that number three? Mm -hmm. Number three. No, it's inherent. It's inherent in the I whole think so. argument. You don't have to say in a multi. I'd spell it out so that there's no. Well, I'd spell it out so that there's no ambiguity. There's no requirement for a 75 foot buffer on a single. There's also no allowance for the other items. There are, yeah. I mean, there aren't, but. I mean, you. Out of an abundance of caution, you could say. In a multifamily. Well, I was going to say that, but then sentence number two, you don't want that to be just for multifamily, right? You want that to apply to everything. Well, I guess that wouldn't, because you're going to set that aside on a separate lot yeah, in a single-family yeah, development. Be, yeah, it has to be set aside So on a you could lot. say number three for multifamily developments, and then the rest of it. Multifamily and multi-dwelling? Mm -hmm. Yes. So coming out of here tonight, this will go before the council. I was on the council agenda meeting yesterday. It is scheduled for Monday's council agenda to be for vote to schedule and public hearing and approve advertising. And and we're going to offer to the council prior to their advertising, if they would like, that um, we can make available um, uh, representatives from the planning board as well as our planner and our um, legal counsel for a workshop mm -hmm. um, so that any counselors, and, and if that's the case, we'll probably put together a presentation with a lot of pictures and, yeah. and <laughs> VA's laughing. But I mean, examples of what conservation well, development looks like. I think that's critically that. important right. yeah. given yeah. all of the great discussion that we've had here. Right. <clears throat> pictures People worth a thousand that, words. But if you can right. show it in a, a picture's worth pictures, a thousand oh, words. I get it. Yeah. That makes sense. That's yeah. an excellent sentence. Yeah. So it'll be up to the council whether they take us up on that offer, but we are going to make that offer because there is a lot to digest here. Um, and so is. is it, plus, it, I think we'll put them in better shape when they have a public hearing and people are getting up with questions that they've already asked and answered and aren't, you know, and aren't alarmed about. Because there is a deadline. I mean, the moratorium expires at the end of June, June and, you know, and once that's expired, it's expired. So whatever can be adopted before then is good. When we do public hearing, I'm just thinking, like, based on the experience, like, that you you know, in essence, for the lack of a better word, when we talk about socialize the idea with us, a couple, what, in the last meeting, you showed the pictures, you explained it, it made it really digestible to understand what was happening here, so I don't know if that's possible, because... I think, I, I think probably, it might not be as long as maybe a presentation that was given at the workshop, yeah. but certainly at the public hearing, it yeah. would definitely help to have an overview yeah. presentation, for sure. I think it's extremely important because I'm sure Deb and Jay have learned a lot because they have been so attentive to the planning board and zoning board meetings now. They know a lot more than the rest of the council and I think it would be extremely important to get everybody on board. But, uh, I agree. You agree? Thank you, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. Ashley, do you want for giggles, just in, so everybody here can see it, do you want to show them um, the uh, Bliss Homestead from our GIS? Sure. So while she's pull pulling that up, is our next step to vote on approving this? Yes. Right, and recommending that the council adopt it, yeah, yeah. that is. I have a question of Todd. When, when we're changing the zones, do we 
individuals have to be noticed? This is a town-wide, so no specific notice would not be required in this instance. Okay, I wanted to help. What's the street? Old Farm, uh, Google, um, Farmer. <laughs> I just need one that go. should Look work. Up Mullen. M-U-L-L-I-N. I got it. There you go. And I know we did a workshop last year about how to use the GIS system. It's all Since different. Changed it's it. all brand new. It's terrible. I apologize. It's awful. So if, yeah, if it takes time to get used it, to, yeah, so that's all. Same, but it's well, this changed different. since you gave me mine too. Yeah. I was trying to figure out what we're going It changed like yesterday. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I don't think so. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know about that. So yeah. Yeah. I think it was, was yesterday. Delayed. Your was delayed. You Whoa. Until yesterday. A lot of the towns are going to this system now. Yeah. Okay. So this this here is a conservation development and this piece is open space that's part of the development one piece of the open space and so is this beautiful field here and so these are all the lots and you can see they kind of they all the lots are slightly different in size and the way that they're you know they're structured on the road and they you know some of them have you know driveways that go to the front and some of them have driveways that come into the side and this happens to be a fairly wooded neighborhood so when you drive through there the houses are lovely and the lots are very very private but they also have this beautiful piece of open space there and and then they've got this you know beautiful this one here you know, too. view of this open field there it's really really nice and if you um that's not part of it this this one is here. And do they all have, I mean, I know where this is, I've driven up there, but do they all have equal access to like the field? And the they have a homeowner's So they have, a, in their case, they have a homeowner's association. So they have a responsibility for maintaining that. We're not suggesting that there be a homeowner's association, that some other, and you know, some other, either the town, if the town's willing to accept it, or some other conservation group um, takes ownership of that lot and maintains it. But if you click on... I, we need I mean, to be clear about this, though, Bill. The intent is not for the open space to be used, even passively. Very cool. So that field is technically not part of the conservation. This in is the, not a conservation. In, no. This was a rural residential. This is a rural residential. Okay. But design-wise, design okay, yes. gotcha. design it's similar. You know, the entity that owns the open space will be re required to create a, a conservation management plan for it. So, depending, right? If it's already if it's already a field and it's not treated and it's being left, and they say, well, you know, it's fine if people walk around the fine. I also think if it's if it's conservation open space that backs up to something where there are trails. So say it backed up to Weedemo Woods and the entity said, okay, fine, but we're gonna put a we're gonna create a path that allows these homeowners to Access. get us. You know, that's something that they will the owner of that open space with their conservation management plan will come to the planning board and if it makes sense then the planning board will probably say fine. The idea though isn't that you know, or we're throwing parties up on the yeah, yeah that they're or or that you know the kids have cut a motocross track through there, or you know somebody's cut all the trees down because they wanted a view of something else, or you know, that's not the idea. Um, but Ashley, if you click on any one of those and then like pull up the tax card, you can see a little bit. You know, I think that one was done before the landscaping was in, but they they all look a little bit different. They all face slightly differently they're very private you know it's really nicely done Dennis, so. Dennis Talbot you know he's a builder and he did a lot of the building in these on these lots yeah and Abel Hart's that Abel Hart's another one that that was done that way Abel Hart isn't as nice as this one so. speak up speak up so everyone on TV can hear you Okay. <laughs> Any more questions about this ordinance? Thoughts? Yeah, Are we ready to, to make a motion? Yeah. Do you want it amended? The open space 
uh, Article 9. It, make a motion to three. adopt this as amended for Article 9. Article section 9. Two. Section 3. Section 3. As discussed. So moved. Is there a second? Article 9, Section 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? A second. Uh, second. I'm sorry if I can second it. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Okay, we nice are work. getting there. I know that this is yeoman's work, everybody, so thank you. Um, subdivision regulations. So there is, Ashley has created a set of subdivision regulations that go with this because the meat of, you know, how the process works is in the subdivision regulations. And I believe that those are ready and can be distributed as you requested. Right now. So we're not looking at them tonight, well, but you will have these in lots and lots yeah, of time to review them. So they're getting. Uh, right. You get a whole month, Rosemary. Oh, really? <laughs> not a Friday night? Nope. No. When the <laughs> there were. A, a, I realized that, you know, this is a lot in a short period, but Thank you. it was not for lack of effort, I will Thank tell you, you that. Oh, you did a great job. To explain why they need to go down. Okay. Um, Before you go anywhere, Trish, let me. Trisha did yeoman's work herself and went to the clerk's office and discovered that at one point, some years ago, the town council granted this board authority to adopt its own subdivision regulations. That's cool. Nobody asked any questions. I so, you shall now. Adoption of these will be up to you. It'll be a public hearing, advertised three successive weeks beforehand, just like the zoning ordinance for the town council, but it'll be yours, okay? There we go. Um, so that brings us to our next thing, which are special use permits, and we're going to ask the council uh, <laughs> Well, mine too. I started having dreams about these. Oh actually. gosh, That's, you know it's bad then. Okay, so we are going to ask the council um, to extend for a bit the nose on the special use permit. So, um, uh, in the particular methodology that Tiverton has picked to update its zoning code, which got very much complicated by the. Uh, General Assemblies passing all these bills. What has happened is that, and this goes to Bill's point earlier, that Ashley's firm has been working on special use permits as they existed. Meanwhile, the Zoning Update Committee has been reviewing zones and looking at all the uses in those zones. And not only is the Zoning Committee making some recommended changes to the actual zoning, right, of the land that's in, that's part of any given zone, but they're also making recommendations as to the uses and special use permits. So we're on a collision course here. And what we've realized is that it makes sense not to send a set of changes for special use permits to the council to get them into the council before June 30th when the no's expire, only to be coming back a month or 30 days or 60 days or 90 days later with a whole changing them all back because that's what came out of the zoning update committee, came to the planning board and the planning board agreed with the zoning update committee. It just doesn't make any sense to do it that way. Um, so we're going to ask the council for more time on these and instead of getting them in one big block, they'll get them as tranches as part of the actual zone that's getting reviewed, which I think makes a lot of sense. So. Um, Todd has suggested August 31st maybe, but that's sort of arbitrary. I did have a discussion with the town administrator, and he thought the council would be lucky to get through all of them by the end of November. Keeping in mind that there are a lot of zones, and you know we can't give the council everything at once, and all of these things are going to have to have manda you know, mandatory public hearings, three weeks of advertising, you know, before they can be adopted. So, um, you know, and the council's got a lot on its plate right now with the budget and, uh, you know, union contracts and everything else. It's not like their agendas are just 
open for us to give them all the zoning things that we want because they have other business to do. So I am going to suggest so that we don't have to do this twice. Um, and since the town administrator was comfortable with this, that we um, amend that to November 30th. Um, I just wanted a starting place. Yep, yeah, Todd just wanted a starting place. Um, so that that would keep um, that would keep the no's no's for now until at which time we start sending them S's and, and uh, Y's um, that they can adopt. Do you feel that uh, the other community is going to be set their stuff by November? Oh, yeah. So right now there are um, <clears throat> the waterfront zone, the, the all of Main Road, General Commercial, Bliss Four Corners are all done, are basically done. And so as soon as we get this off our plate, that's the next thing that's coming over here um, for the planning board to take up. So I think that committee's doing a pretty good job of getting through the zone. So I, I think that they, that's not gonna be the issue, but it will take time for us to go through them and then get them over to the council. And we'll, they will stay a no until the council advertises yeah. and votes on it. Yeah. But when they, vote on a certain section, the rest still stay no. Yes, so whatever they vote on will get will get changed till the next section comes to them. It's not like they all get lifted once. No. Right, right. And, and we also know that there are some applicants, but I think they are in zones that are pretty, that are pretty, are basically ready to come over here so we can get those done kind of post haste. And, um, if there are things that people are requesting, then you know we'll try and move them to the top of the pile just so that we can accommodate people. What was the date? November? November, November 30. 30. To have the, everything complete, right? So we're yeah. going to start this process. It'll come from zoning, come to us. We'll approve. It'll go to town council. They'll do the whole rigmarole. They'll approve it. It'll apply for the ones that we've approved. Then the next group will come over. and So, so are we trying to get this done before January? <laughs> we're going to do we're going to try and get it done before November 30th. Well, <laughs> That's the goal. I'm just saying, we're going to have an election. We're going to have a whole potentially new council. Yeah. New council starting yeah. from scratch. Yeah. Like it would That's be why good November to sort of see. That's why November 30th is the number. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's sort of what I'm getting. The way the, way the well, ordinance the reads right now is that it's a sunset provision. So at, at its sunset, it will flip back to whatever it was before it was enacted so now the request is to push that sunset to the mm -hmm. november 30th okay so we prevent that flip over so uh i'll make a mo are we looking yeah, for a motion right here right make a motion to extend the uh sunset provision uh to november 30th or make the request of the council to extend the sunset provision until November 30th 2024 any other discussion all in favor unanimous uh, what have we got next the zoning will we've already done the marijuana thing uh, special use permits we've sort of um, given ourselves now a plan to go forward with special use permits, right? I have a question. When it comes from the next zoning group, with knowing that we've got a, a, a zoning board, words VA, um, do we need to have, because I know everybody wants to hang out with me on a Friday here, do we need to set up a special meeting? To Just me. So, <laughs> so we, we are going we, we to talk about that before we adjourn. Um, so hang on to that thought for just a second. Um, but I think that brings us up to item G, which is, um, is there anything on the legislative update, Ashley, that we should know about so that we can have more agita and anxiety? <laughs> Tell them about the 30%. The what? I don't want to know. I'm the afraid. The 30%. Too far Um, so there is a amendment to inclusionary zoning to put back what makes sense, which is a not a two for one, but a one for one. So for everyone who threw out inclusionary zoning, you could maybe get it back now because it's not an outrageous automatic density bonus. 
Um, so we'll have to see how that goes, and then you could you could think about you know pulling inclusionary zoning back in. Um, they did a bunch of or and I when I say they I'm I'm saying the house has is pushing these through where I don't know what the Senate is going to do. Um, they're, they've pushed through some technical amendments to the subdivision changes that were made. Um, there's a provision to allow mobile homes to count um, for a cert for I think for 50%. So they would count as like half units, not as full units. Um, it's mobile and manufactured <coughs> homes. Um, there is, I'm saving the best for last. Um, trying to think of what else is, what else the house has pushed forward. Um, the one that I would say is most in contention right now is there was a, the original bill was a provision that said that you had to permit residential in all commercial zones so there was a pushback that that is just a blanket policy without any thought whatsoever um and that a majority of most municipalities are zoned residentially and now you're basically invading into limited commercial districts and forcing the allowance of residential with you know like I said no real thought to it um, the response to that pushback was even was even worse, worse. Uh, and that bill, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that bill, although it, we were told that the intent of that bill was that you would had to zone 30% of your total land area to permit for, how did they word it, to permit for? Two family, I thought. Two family or multifamily development. It didn't read like that. When you read the plain language of, of the way they wrote it, it would have required that every zoning district that constituted at least 30% of your total land area would have been required to permit two family and multifamily by right. And that was the sub A. So that sub A was up for consideration. We asked the sub, we asked that the sub A get held because it was a complete 180 in approach. Like it didn't even resemble the original bill. Normally the sub A is somewhat tied to the original bill and you can make the connection between the original bill and the sub a and you can like link those things together and kind of figure out how you got from the original bill to the sub a we complained about the original bill and its premise and they did like a whole a complete 180 and rewrote the sub a where there was no connection whatsoever so we then made the argument that this is a sub a and when when you get a sub a that goes up for consideration, there's no testimony. So our argument then was, this is a completely different bill that nobody has had the chance to discuss or testify on. It's, you've completely changed the approach here. We started with what was understood to be a premise of, let's incorporate residential into our commercial districts and completely switched to let's increase density in resident in already residentially zoned districts it's like those two things you're it's apples and oranges so my understanding and i was told this by a former lobbyist who spent lots and lots of time up there that's only the second time ever in his history of time at the state house that he ever saw a sub a that was up for consideration not get out of committee 
Do, do they have any comprehension that multifamily? <laughs> you I, really I, can I, ask I, me that question. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, thought I was like, nope, I don't know what she's really going to ask me. Do they have any comprehension, you know, with this that that multifamily development requires a certain level of infrastructure, and if you don't have that infrastructure, you just can't do it? Like, is there any sort of, like, I'm taking it the answer is no. Figure it out. Thank you, everyone. Figure it out. Well, I'll say that when we when we opposed the original bill, the request was, if you want to set a bar, fine, set a bar, give the municipalities the ability to decide how they reach the bar, because they should all be able to reach it differently. They should they should all get to consider their own unique circumstances. Like if you want to say. You know, you have to achieve a certain level of residential whatever because we all know this is housing driven. Fine, but let them figure out how they have to get there. Like, give them the tools they need, let them make their own decisions, let them design their own zoning, let them do a study, whatever they need to get themselves to whatever the bar is that you want them to achieve. The response was. 30% of your, yeah. So th if that can speak to answer your question, that was the response to uh, our request to allow the municipalities to figure out how to reach that, reach whatever the goal is, how to get there, let them make their own choices, leave their destiny in their hands. So, so then we, well, we proposed language um, that basically said, that municipalities have to have at least one mixed use district that permits multifamily development. And in order to determine where that district is and what it's comprised of, the municipality can conduct a study of its own determination to you know, make those decisions. And that's all we said. And we put it in a different section because they keep dumping everything into the permitted uses section and they're just cluttering it. It was, that's not what it was designed for. That's where they dumped adaptive reuse and then they were going to dump this in there. And it's not the appropriate section of, of enabling legislation. So we picked a new section and we tried to give them language. And they've, I just got a copy today of what that has been turned into a sub A of. So I have not had a chance to go through that in detail. I can't tell you at this point, you know, what that means. What it, you know, is it good? Is it bad? Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. This, that is the one bill I'll say is probably going to result in something that you're going to have to do. I don't, at this point, I don't know what it is. Um, but it, it remains to be seen what the Senate is going to do. Right. Right. Well, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Cheery update. Oh, Lord. Uh, and the accessory dwelling unit, the Senate introduced its own ADU bill, which is a bill that was drafted in between um, APA and the... Um, their name is out, I've lost them, uh, AARP, excuse me. So we, we feel comfortable with that ADU bill. We think it's much better than, than the version that came out last year. We think it's a better version. It's a good compromise than the version that the House introduced. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to do to reconcile those two bills because there's a House version and a Senate version. They're pretty different Far from each other. Yeah. Um, I hope that the Senate version is the version that passes. Something needs to pass because the existing legislation on ADUs is so internally inconsistent that you cannot, you can't implement it at the local level. Yeah. So. Well, there we go. <laughs> Our legislators at work. Um, uh, I'm a parent. Are you sorry to ask? No, no. Well, I mean, we need to know this. So I, I again, would I would encourage the council to call our senators and let them know because they seem to be a little more rational. Um, maybe 
maybe there are some of these things that that can be uh, amended in yeah, the Senate. Yeah, we've been talking to the to the Senate more. Uh, you know, the answers that we're getting. Are new. I don't know which mics are coming from. But, um, well, if we knew there was a problem, you know, we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have done it. We wouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, so um, I have, as I have chair, and you can tell I'm rusty at chairing a meeting. It's been a while. Um, it just occurred to me that I, there's one more thing that we have to vote on, but it's, it's somewhere uh, wrapped up in item E, which I was the special use permit thing, and I thought we had voted on that, and I forgot. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to have to go back to something here. That's fine. Uh, zoning Article 4, Section 15, the proposed list of prohibited uses. This is the other thing that expires, or it not, doesn't actually expire, but um, oh, uh, courtesy of the General Assembly now that if something is not listed as a prohibited use, then uh, you have the right to appeal to the Zoning Board to see if there's a similar use and you can make the case that it can be allowed. Previously, our zoning code said that if it wasn't on the uh, allowed list, then it was specifically prohibited. So this is a list of uses that we have discussed some of them here. Some of them are from the Zoning Update Committee. Um, a few of them are from John Hoyle. They're kind of a mix um, that would be added to the town's existing prohibited uses list. So we do need to vote on these as far as a recommendation for the town council. Um, I'll give you all a second to see them in case you have any questions. I had, a, I, had one. I had a question. Commercial electric vehicle charging station. Like, wh what is... There's four new things at the end of this. It, it, it's a, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm trying to better understand. I don't recall seeing that on here before, and I'm trying to better understand. The zoning committee added that. The zoning committee added that, and you'll notice that it says commercial. I think. So I'm looking for a definition of what constitutes commercial versus for profit, a public for profit station. So I think what the zoning update committee was concerned is that, and we're going to have to come up with something. I mean, we are going to have to have these, but they yeah. were concerned. Um, that there's no, with no guidance, what happens when somebody just, you know, puts one in their front yard and says, well, you know, you, you can pay me to do this? Or what happens if any business decides, well, hey, I'm going to just put some, I'm going to put some commercial. Well, we have that. Stations. Like, look at Vidi. There's, there's one on Sousa Road. There's one on Sousa Road. problem with that one. They didn't get permission. They didn't get permission. Okay. So we know that what we need to do is create regulations for this but we have none right now so in the absence of that we don't the zoning update committee was concerned that well you know we don't want people we don't want businesses just sticking theirs with these wherever they want on their property if you don't have enough parking for your business as it is so some of the things are on the are on this list because we need to get to them they maybe won't stay here permanently but for now they're here yeah i, I would argue that I know the zoning board has a lot on their plate, but I think demand for this is only going to continue to increase. So our inability to sort of build out the infrastructure on a local level is probably going to become problematic. So, so I agree with you. <laughs> um, how would you would would you like to? Would you like to maybe draft a little bit or at least come up with some concepts? Because this is something the planning board can take up as soon as we have something i mean we can do this do we have to come up with or is it zoning no, like who's planning, who's planning right zoning we write the zone the us. zoning board has nothing to do with drafting sure I'll, I'll, zoning. I'll do some research on it yeah i mean if, if you don't have to necessarily you know write the legal language and everything and we have actually yeah have i mean if you, if help, you can do it, some research i mean i think one of one of the things we talked about because one went in it wasn't permitted there was no review there's been mm -hmm. i guess some complaints that like vehicle lights are shining in windows because it wasn't like nobody knew so those are the types of things we want to look at and 
prevent from happening. So we would want to look for, you know, what are the best practices in citing these charging right. stations? Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and if you give us what you find between Todd and I, we can write a regulation. Yeah. Because we know we need one and we need one soon, but you know, for now. And things like parking. I mean, we have businesses that don't have enough parking as it is, but if they see this is an opportunity, well, I'm going to add some of these and I'm going to make some more money and you already don't have enough parking, like, you know, um, sort of thing. So that's why that was there. Any other questions on any of these? Jim, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I just had a question on the private beach. Like, if somebody has, uh, how is, like, has waterfront property that rolls up to a beach? What does that mean that they can't have it? So I, I, that's not your beach. That's you're going to open a private beach that you're going to charge. Oh, me. I got you. <laughs> you know, okay. in other words, I, I live on the you. waterfront and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to have a private, okay. have a private like beach. Like it's club. a public private, like I'm going to open like a beach club beach. in my yard kind of thing. I'm going to open you. a, okay. I'm going to open a beach <laughs> club in my yard, which, which has been tried. I <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. It was town. a combination private beach club wedding event center. <laughs> um, Dick, did you have one? Yeah, the brew pub. I think this. Oh, is yeah. Honor. I, I, I could see eliminating it or read like it's a stipulating public. where uh, uh, it's made on premises and served. But how does it differ from a bar if they don't brew it there? I had asked a question about brew pubs last meeting, and the explanation made sense. If you are actually physically <clears throat> brewing the beer, that's very water intensive. We have water issues in town. I, I sort of get that. I mean, some of these, if we can sort out the water issues, you know, if they get sorted out, some of these could come off the list. It's the same reason golf courses are on there. I mean, a golf course is a nice thing, but they use a lot of water. But so, to. Um, uh, but the, to the point here, though, is brewery and brew pub, a brew pub is, in essence, a bar, right? If they're not making the stuff on service. So these are kind the of... The definition says a brew pub is a brewery. That has, has yeah, a we already have, have a brewery. Right I, see, right I, see, right. I see, but they are saying you can't brew and serve. Right. That's so a brew pub, is that's you a brew, brew and serve. serve. And then we can't have a brewery, which is just the manufacturing brew, of the beer. Brew. Okay. I get you. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody else? Uh, okay. I don't know if I like the public beach definition, but okay. Yeah. Well, what, would you do you want to amend it? Go ahead. Where public access is limited or prohibited? I mean, that's your own. I have beachfront property. I'm not allowing the public to come onto mine. Um, but it's like a public private. I think. Yeah. 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 If you want, I, maybe it needs the word club then. Private oh, beach yeah. or, club. A, or private beach. A private beach club maybe. Or something, yeah, not just or a commercial, you know, a commercial or a a a, a commercial excluding beach. home residential beach. I don't know. Well, I mean, I think the issue is it's a co it's commercial, right? Yeah. I mean, if you live on the water and you have a beach, that's your beach, and if you want to have your friends over, that's fine. I think the yeah, idea is that this is where public up, access is limited or prohibited, right? Uh, but I, you, I don't have that in front of me. Can you read the definition? Sorry. It says it waterfront says, real property owned by an individual or organization where public access is limited or prohibited. And the term is just private beach. Maybe it needs a different term, but you get the idea that somebody isn't going to charge people or have people. I have a beach. But the flip side of this is that you can't have your own. That people could just show up on your property too. But I see, like the, the reality is, is that it can't. Like well, it's basically a commercial. If I, well, I think I understand that because if I own the property, public access is limited because yeah. I own the property. Right. You can't just walk onto the property because right. I own it. Prohibiting that. Yeah. Right. So I think what the definition needs to read is is that it's converting that private property into a commercial into a venture. Commercial venture. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. It, it's uh, you're 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 making money over letting people come right. and right. Yeah. Wouldn't they have to get like stuff for that anyways? Would they have to come to the town to basically start a business on their property? <laughs> like what is that like? No. <laughs> No. no. So I yes, yes, VA. In most of the real world, that is absolutely true. <laughs> so, 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 so
so are we going to wordsmith here? Trying. I do think it should be club, right? Or 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 some or the language needs to denote the, the converting uh, or, or, or of or private to a Or you just say something like a you know a a a commercial venture where a uh, commercial venture where you know where ac you know access requires a fee or you know I think you could say waterfront real property owned by an individual or organization that is privately owned and administered as a commercial enterprise or club. That's what the that's the prohibited part. Yeah, that's is the that prohibited it is part. administered as a commercial enterprise or club. Right. Because you can you can res I can restrict access to a beach by not letting people walk through my property to get to the beach. That's not the issue. It's that I can't use that yeah, we don't want you trying to char way charge people to as a club, <laughs> yeah, or as some commercial type of business. I'm looking at the 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 legal definition of a private beach, and it has that language: privately owned bathing okay. beach administered as a commercial enterprise or club. Where's well, the there legal you go. definition? Law Insider. Fantastic. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Susan Anderson has a question. Yes. That's different. A yacht club is actually in our zoning code. It, that's actually in our use table. Because they have a beach. Is this a private beach thing? What's that? Is this a I think it, I think it's because somebody tried it once before. Yeah. No, I think well, like if somebody needed. doesn't want to like if Fogland is busy or whatever, and you have like a nice beachfront property, I could totally see like being like, hey, you can come to my house, park my yeah, park, park in my yard for ten bucks, park in my yard for park ten bucks, park park for 10 bucks, bucks on the beach, <laughs> and I make twenty bucks for every person I can yeah. fit. This is Terran. <laughs> I mean, is it's it kind of a genius. No, but it's happened in the past. <laughs> I can see it happening in the future as building does happen. Like, people don't realize that we have these cute little beaches and yeah. they are close and easy to access. Well, okay, if we're worried about it, we can take it out, but that's, I, it, that, that is why it's it there. It does need to be wordsmith, though. It's like taking Does adding that it. language, though, help? That sounds good, oh. actually. Yeah. Okay. You got it. Did you add it? No. Oh, you can cut and paste right there, yes. I don't have the document open. I don't have it as a Word document. Okay. Say it one more time, actually. A privately owned bathing beach administered as a commercial enterprise or a club. I will add it to my to-do list. Yeah. Yeah. So do we need a motion to accept this as amended? Yes. 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 I will make a motion to accept the additional prohibited uses document as discussed and amended this evening. I will second that. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, update from the North Tiverton Business Park Committee since Stu is not here. Um, I don't think we'll have that tonight. And uh, I, I, mean, I can tell you what I know if you care. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, they have uh, finalized their RFP. I'm charged with responding to it. Um, Can you clarify uh, what the RFP? So the RFP is that they want to do a master plan study of the of North Tiverton, and that would include a like a public engagement component. They want to look at, you know, they want to look at the 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 pieces of North Tiverton in terms of, you know, what is allowed to be developed, what are the standards for development, you know, what what ways can they kind of improve overall, you yeah. know, how North Tiverton can be redeveloped, um, anything that's not developed, how does that get developed, really like a North End master plan, yeah. essentially. And is this basically, so when we say, just for operationally speaking, when we say North End, we're talking everything north of 24? 
They have so like a, North uh, Sousa? They have a district that's defined. Okay. I don't All right, that's have fine. that exact, but that's fine. I can, we can certainly bring that back. Whenever. Um, it's not a list of uses. So they're going to meet on the... Do you understand what I'm trying yeah. to say? They were supposed to... Thank they you, 22nd. They should. Um, to, at that right? time, right? Yeah. review so the response to the RFP, section. work and through whatever comments, questions they have. Um, and then move, move forward, move towards, you know, having Weston and Samson um, work with the, the group sure. eventually to, to do that master plan study and, and basically create a set, a set of recommendations um, for the North End, specifically for the North End. Yeah, Does makes it sense. Make sense. Like I know we haven't talked a lot about master plan stuff because we're entrenched in this, but like, does, does it make sense for a larger study for the whole town? So we have one cohesive massive master plan. So you have a comprehensive plan, which is your whole town. Um, these are these are kind of like spin-offs of. Looking at specific areas within your town that would address specific issues that are identified. So the comprehensive doesn't really go to the level of which they're looking for. for no, so the, co the comprehensive plan would be the place where you would say something like, do a North End, you know, master plan study to, you know, pursue opportunities for redevelopment in the North End. And then that, now you do that master plan study. And, you know, it's important that all of these things get tied back together and that they stay consistent. You want a master plan study that's not consistent with your comprehensive plan, but this would be, this is like taking a deeper dive on a specific area. I just I just wanted to make sure it wasn't the other way around where we're doing one and we haven't done the larger. At some point, amend these to include definitions for the ones that need definitions. That's it. Okay, pretty good. I make it. So make motion to enter. No, no we have one more thing, Rosemary. I'm leaving. You're leaving? No, just wait. <laughs> Please. We're almost done. Sorry. So um so did you want to bring this up here? Um I can have the town council do it, but I wanted to talk about the prohibited uses that we just discussed. What you have there is a list of uses with definitions. They're really just definitions. And my thought is that those should be in the definition section. And then the prohibited use list is really just a list of those uses. And if that's what you want me to suggest to the town council, but I can certainly do that to make sure that their advertising is correct. Or we can just change section 15 prohibited uses and add in what you just adopted like or we, recommended like we have now in the code is just a listing without a definition correct so, some so of i'm them, saying some you have yeah. definitions i'm saying yeah. you amend the definition section with what you just saw and then take those bold terms right brew pub yeah. brewery and add those to section 15 mm -hmm. which is prohibited use list I mean, whatever is the most cleanest, sort of yeah. not going to. You don't care one way or the other. No. Yeah, whatever is cleanest and easier, yeah. and and it, the, the less confusing for people yeah. is the way to do it. Path, right. of, path of least resistance. I'll discuss it with the solicitor. Okay. That's a good idea. Um, so here's the last thing on our agenda. Well, it's not really on our agenda, but we're going to discuss it. It is on um, the agenda. Then. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's whether or not we have a date held for a special meeting, which is May 16th. 16th. May 16th. Okay. So we have that date that's held for a special meeting. I'm going to almost on bended knee ask if we can have that. And the reason being is that those subdivision regulations that you got tonight, those need to be adopted. Um, and we need to. We need to go through them. We need to vote to advertise them and set a public hearing for them for us to adopt them. And ideally, we should adopt them 
almost immediately, assuming that the council adopts the conservation development, because we really need those subdivision regulations. So, you know, we can't adopt the subdivision regulations in August. You know, if we have somebody come in with a, who wants to do a conservation development fairly soon, we've got to have those. So that means that if we could meet on the 16th to go through those, um, and make sure that we're, you know, we're comfortable with them, and we vote to go out to advertise them and pick a date for a public hearing. By then, we'll know when the council's public hearing is going to be, so we'll know when the council might be adopting these. So, how do we feel about and the sixteen? At six thirty, we can be flexible. I, it's my, I'm coaching a soccer clinic. It ends at seven at Long Clax. I can be here by seven fifteen. We were told by Ed earlier, I think. Yeah. yeah. You know, did you have a quorum? Did you have a quorum? We have a quorum for the 16th. It's the only date we have a quorum for. Yeah. That's a Wednesday. Yeah. A Thursday. Thursday. It's a Thursday. It's Thursday. Yeah. It's a Thursday. I can't be there. I'll be on That's travel right. the 16th. Right. You're going to yep. be You will be. Yeah. Okay. Janice um, will not be here. And Janice will not be here. Yeah. Uh, Stu Chris will be back. Baby. Stu will be back. Yep. We'll okay. probably have a new person by then. Too. And we might yeah, even we have a new member by then. And we might have but a so we could start at 6:30 and VA I'll gets here. Will a potential 17. new member be available on the 16th? He's not paying attention already. Demerits. <laughs> <laughs> For a special meeting. I'm available. Okay. If you were appointed. Okay. Thank you. Right. So. This morning. I don't think it will take a terribly long time. VA, do you mind if we start at 6.30? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. But we can start at 7 if that's if everybody doesn't mind either. So you guys pick. I don't care. As long as you, I just don't, what I would say is make sure you have a quorum. quorum. Because I don't want you sitting here for 45 minutes. Clapping when you come in yeah. the door, yes, I know. 6.30. Clapping, yes. Yeah. 6.30. Yes, okay. I mean, I love, right. I love, I, love, I, think, I, love we, I, I think, I think we have a quorum. Yeah. Is it actually available? Have a quorum. Yes, I, I have Chris already have an out. <laughs> and Stu will be here. And yes. Yeah. So we should have a quorum. Um, you know, in VA, when you get here, whatever questions you have, you should feel free to ask, even if we, you know, moved on from that section. So we can do that. Thank you, everybody, for agreeing to the, do that. That's that's really good. Ed, Thank you. can you send the subdivision stuff out electronically yes. and make sure that um, Stu knows that he can pick up a paper copy? Yes. Or and anyone else who's not here. We can get them a paper copy. Yes. So before we go, I would just like to. I, um, to you, did I? No. I would like to um, thank Stu in at, who's not here, but really did a lot of work on this, and and um, and I would also like to especially thank Ashley and Todd for all of their assistance on this. Uh, this was a lot of work in a really short period of time. And uh, these are things that are long overdue. They're things that we've talked about in not just our last comprehensive plan, but the comprehensive plan before that and the comprehensive plan before that. And we are finally on the cusp of actually being able to implement some of those. So um, to, to, you know, Stu and Todd and Ashley, thank you so much for all your work on this. And um, to everybody here for being patient in getting through this stuff tonight. I know it's a lot. Um, great job, everybody. Um, so thank you. Ms. Hilton, you deserve a lot of the credit. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank so. From the board too. Really. This one. All right. Now we're as we Can we approve minutes? Yes, please. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Sorry, I'm like, I know. Nobody wants to talk about minutes. Thank you. Yes. Where? Because we don't want to get in trouble. Exactly. Oh, Attorney Lord, General's Lord. office. Exactly. Um, I'm looking at my agenda here, which. Is a motion? Is there a motion to approve the minutes as proposed by Mr. Rotella? Yeah. So um, moved. Second. So motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Good. Yes. Cut out. Okay. Now, Rosemary. I make a, a motion to adjourn. Nine.